two packages. We also have, um, I got Frozen 2, basically. I walked to Target looking for a, um, um, foot bath or something like that. Just, you know, since I've been spending so much more time working from home, figured I'd look to see if there was a better option out there. You know, sometimes I cannot aim. Let's see, so sometimes I'll actually work while standing in the bathtub, letting my feet soak in hot water. It's kind of nice and relaxing, and you know, given that kind of the biggest problem is when my legs get restless because I'm sleep deprived. I guess I'll we'll add it and do this. And I just kind of figured, you know, that's fine, but if I could find a better thing, maybe I'd pick it up. But I couldn't find anything like that at Target. It's, maybe it's too small for Target. Or maybe, um, <clears throat> I don't know. Anyways, you know, picked up Frozen 2 while I was at it. I <clears throat> haven't heard anything good or bad about it. I've seen some things that suggest that there's maybe some bad things about it, but I haven't heard of it, like, creating big waves one way or the other so it's probably not as good as the first movie but it might not be bad and it might have its flaws so I'm kind of curious to see um, I was just looking at this and th those stickers overlap so I'm gonna have to figure those out together anyways we have um <clears throat> Black Clover season 2 part something Sneeze. Sorry. Um, I mean, I think it says a part four there. But I don't remember this much of season two already being out, so I'm just a bit confused. I don't remember what I ordered. Not that I ever do. Not that I ever catch up on stuff. I did watch some anime this past week. Oh my gosh, but only some... But anyways, uh, looking at this, Regions A and B, English dub, I think that's all pretty common. Special features. We have episodes 87, 89, commentary inside the episodes for 84, 87, 90, Texas opening and ending songs. Some fairly usual stuff there. That's season 2, part 4, Blu-ray 1, Blu-ray 2. DVD 1, DVD 2. Now that's a brush and it looks like red ink. But not knowing the show, I can't tell you for certain if that's definitely red ink and not like the one ink that is the blood of his enemies or something like that. And I couldn't tell who that little guy in the background was. Next up we have Kono Oto Tomari, Sounds of Life. It's a pretty neat looking thing. I'm I think it's because these blue school uniforms, there's something kinda of relaxing about them. Oh that wasn't too bad. <clears throat> and I kinda of figure looking at the front is more important because if it's got a different Slip cover, and usually it's the front that you'll see that's different. Oof. Okay, I see region A B, I see an English dub. I was just wondering, this is just Blu ray only, I think. A lot more of this stuff coming out even um, from Funimation. Special features. Episode 7 commentary with English cast. Texas opening 8 ending song? Opening and ending songs. That's not an 8. Hmm. We've got postcards. And since they're not in plastic, we'll go ahead and take get them. 
other two. Let's see, maybe that's a music sheet there. I'm not sure, but or maybe that's actually a recorder and a little cloth used to contain it. But I don't see anything musical about that. I think that's a more traditional Japanese instrument. Hmm. It's interesting because I almost feel like. This one feels different because it makes me feel like the other ones should be more instrumental, I guess. Like maybe she's the only one living up to I th what I think of as the concept of this anime. Even though I haven't seen it and I don't know what it's about. I'm guessing if they put these two male characters on the front and there's that one again and that one again. Then maybe they're more important. Like maybe the story is about them or something. I don't know. All I know is I'm going in from the top. And last but not least, we have After War Gundam X. And I think this is two. Is that a... I, can't, I can't see it through the camera. Yeah, that that down there is a dark green two against a black background. Not the best choice, especially since the lighting in this apartment is, you know, it feels fine. But it isn't until I walk into the kitchen or the front door that I realize that the apartment itself is a little dim. It's a little cloudy outside, so that doesn't make it any better. But normally, because I have all the curtains closed, anyways, the lighting tends to be pretty consistent. Which I'm sure isn't a contributor to my um, sleep schedule allowing me to do whatever I want. Anyways, that's a, looks like it's uh, Japanese with English subtitles only. I see an A there suggesting it's region A only. And I feel loose discs. Mm. Those there. Two guys. Okay. So this mecha thing in front made me think that they were, they were wearing mecha armor, but actually I think they just are wearing kind of jackety sort of things. And we've got Discs four, five, and six. Looking at the moon. Um, two kids. And a Gundam of some sort in the background. Interesting, but I don't know. Anyways, it's a small update, but here's this week's anime DVD collection update. So basically, Robihachi is the only anime I watched this week. I mean, I guess there were maybe a little bit of scenes of things here and there, but this was the one I watched. I mean, for the past couple of weeks I've been remembering how much I like Brigadoon, but um, this one was actually pretty entertaining. Um, and I didn't watch all of it. I think I'm only maybe six or seven episodes into it. And a part of me wants to continue. So, it was interesting because just before I fired it up, I did notice that the... Um, the rating on um, MAL is a mid six, which usually means it tends to be pretty. Eh. You, you have to be into some pretty specific things to enjoy it. But I didn't find this to be that bad. My guess is this anime probably strikes to a lot of people like it should be wanting, but it isn't quite that. And there's a couple of ideas I have in mind there. Like it almost feels very. Space Cowboy-ish, like Cowboy Bebop, or um, Space Dandy, or Outlaw Star, or something like that. And it isn't quite that. Um, <clears throat> it also kind of has this mecha thing that makes you wonder if maybe there's an interesting mecha story going on, but it isn't that. It's pretty much a just a comedy couple guys... It's kind of a about tourism, space tourism. I think uh, maybe it mentioned something about that in the back. I'm looking at the back. I'm not seeing anything about that. But, so, um, like I kind of predicted, it seemed to be playing heavily on a sort of yaoi joke angle. And the interesting thing about it in that regard, now this is another thing that could cause the rate low, is people could go into it expecting a lot of yaoi undertones, and it's even not very undertone ish it's mostly just there's a lot of gags in there related to it for example the two 
characters when their mecha merges together into one giant robot. You know, when their two little fighters merge into one giant robot for some reason. Um, there's immediate jokes about tops and bottoms. Um, there's also this insinuation that the, or I'm not even, sh I don't think you can really call it insinuation, but there's this thing where the debt collector that is trying to catch our main character, and I call him the main character because he's the person we were introduced to the story through, and the other guy is a almost main character as well. So it's supposed to be set up as a dual pair, but we see things more through the point of eyes of one of the characters versus the other, and that's why I consider him to be the main character when I use that terminology, because he he's kind of the one for which the plot, if you could call it plot, is driving things forward. Um, he's the guy on the run from his debt, and the one person who owns all of the debt seems to have a actual um, attraction to him, and it's played for comedy. It's not played for Oh, he's being hit on by a guy and he's scared. He, he seems to think that he's going to die if he gets caught and not that he's going to have sex with somebody whether or not he wants that to happen or not. It's The relationship is, it reminds me of a very disturbed version of, you know, I mentioned Outlaw Star because that one's a little on the head, of Gene Starwin and I forgot that guy he kept going to. You know, that guy really liked Gene Starwin and it wasn't even just like, he liked him as a person. He thought he was very attractive and would like to have a relationship with him. And, you know, that one always worked out because Gene Starwin set his own um, boundaries. And I can't believe I can't remember the guy's name. But... Basically, you know... There seems to be just kind of a more disturbed version of that where I haven't seen them have a chance to really talk because, you know, their relationship of somebody who's scared for his life running from a debt collector and a debt collector who is in love with the person he, yeah, that's indebted to him, I guess. And so instead, there's just been more jokes along those lines. And a lot of it, I thought, has been pretty funny where it's like, okay, yeah, I guess I can kind of sort of see this logic here in this joke and they're inverting it and... They're doing this and that, and maybe part of the weakness for the series is that there isn't a real strong theming going on. So, like, I think even people who watch a series could be like, okay, now why am I continuing to watch it? Because the truth of the matter is, as amusing and entertaining as I'm finding each individual episode to be, um, the only thing that has me driven to continue watching is curiosity about... I, bet, I hope it says it on the back and I'm kind of looking at it blurry eyed Issa Kandar there we go um, and that one kind of gave me a hint okay maybe that's another hint as to why people don't like it because that one seems to be a direct reference to um, Star Blazer 2199 or Space Battleship Yamato 2199 or you know that maybe not that specific incarnation but rather that series there, where the first story arc of both incarnations of that series are humans trying to get to Isakandar, although it's spelled with a C instead of a K, but it strikes me as not a coincidence that this has been set up that way, and I think it's, there's there could be a lot of little undertones of references to other anime that are, that I'm maybe not picking up, like, overtly, you know, I, I wouldn't say I pick them up subconsciously, but rather... I, I'm wondering if there's something there that's just like this this show is also kind of a nod to a lot of other anime and you know there's other little things here and there that I'm curious about but that's the main one that they introduced that for some reason this is there for some reason it doesn't seem like that advertisement should exist or make sense and for some reason its name makes me think that it's going to be amusingly stupid when they get there but I don't know how and I don't think it's going to be epic. But the show's been using some really amusing stuff, like, um, you know, Pluto. You know, nobody's tourism visiting Pluto, and they hired this ad agency that's giving them all this bad advice, and our main characters are smart enough to tell them, oh, that's really bad advice. And, you know, they'll, they'll play off of things like that, where it's just like, 
they the show seems to know that it's presenting stupid things, it's presenting stupid conflicts to it, but I think it feels intentional in that regard, so I'm surprised that it's as low as a six and a half. Again, my best guess is this show probably has a tendency to make people think it's something different than it actually is. And this is, doesn't even mean like before they watch it. It can do it before they watch it, when they start it, while they're watching it. But I think it's actually a surprisingly okay show. Um, I guess I also have over here um, the 23andMe kit because I've still not taken care of that. The biggest problem is I need to, I need to be able to mail it away. And I haven't yet figured out um, how exactly I'm going to do that. Because I, I know the mailbox here, I took a closer look at it, and the mailbox here is intentionally thin for little letters. So I think what that means is I need to go to a UPS, not a UPS, a USPS Dropbox, or maybe straight to the postal, the post office itself. Which shouldn't be hard to do, but in my spare time, I do just enjoy sleeping lately. Eh, everything's really stressful. But, I, you know, I've had at least one request to at least record document that. I think it's more about the results, but I also want to, you know, record various parts of going through the process of, you know, I'll take a look at it, figure out what I'm supposed to do, then record a video showing Maybe not like spitting into the vial because that's kind of disgusting. You know, I, I doubt that's something y'all want to see. But I can say that, um, you know, I could do a voiceover saying, yeah, here, I, I spit into this thing and now I'm putting it in this box, sealing it up. Now I put it in the post box and send it off and wait for results. Um, probably also not show registering the account because there's probably going to be a password involved in that. And, you know, better not to record that sort of thing. But maybe I can give like a little bit of that. But people, the, the request was more interested in the results, and I'd be interested to see what the results are as well. So, that's on my mind, but like a lot of projects, you know, a lot of projects, it just kind of is building up, I guess. But, it, it, I, I will keep all that in mind. Um, likewise, next week, well, technically, today there wasn't anything new that came out. So, this stuff was stuff that was... They came out that was released last week because you know Amazon doesn't send stuff out to arrive the day that it comes out anymore. They they haven't been doing that all year. This was before COVID nineteen stuff. Um, so right now there are two hentai. I mean, there's a DVD Blu-ray version of a hentai. And if that's all that's arrived for next week, I'll probably do an, a video on omelet making. Not one about telling you how to do, make omelets, but rather my thoughts in terms of what I do when I make omelets. And I will actually make an omelet. You know, because you, it's nice to see people cook, and you know, hopefully my stuff is low level enough that you know, it's something you actually incorporate, ideas you incorporate into any kind of cooking you do, or you look at it and say, hmm, Giga Frost is actually doing that wrong. Hey, Giga Frost, you shouldn't do this because that will introduce food food poisoning. You know, there could be things like that. Otherwise, the other thing I watched um, was the first episode of Lock and Key. Basically, um, I went to my parents um, this past Friday because um, they're getting their kitchen renovated and last Friday most of the stuff was destroyed and most of what used to be the kitchen that has been one of the major kitchens in my life for the past 30 years is now a big empty open space with a sink and an, uh, a stove. And a stove oven, I guess. And... This was a good opportunity to go there to kind of feel what the space is like before stuff was going to be constructed, what it would be like with it, etc., etc. That, of course, meant that nothing was watched, but while we were there, you know, my parents mentioned this show, and so far, first episode is, I'd call it a little weak. It's got some good mystery setup to it. So, a lot of this came up because of, um, what's it called? Stranger Things. And I mentioned that, you know, Stranger Things, I feel, is, as flawed as it is, I can understand why people watched it. I can understand why people maybe stopped watching it, dropped off after the first season, the second season, middle of a season, whatever. But one of the things that, that I really liked about it is at the beginning of the first season, 
you have this real X Files vibe, 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 where they introduce the monster, but they don't introduce the monster. You just get introduced to some of the ideas, and you're like, "That's really creepy." Ooh. And things slowly unfold from there. So, <clears throat> where Stranger Things uh, falls off the boat in that regard is that it um, isn't very X Filesy through the whole thing. Eventually, it becomes Rawr! it's uh, going to get. Me. But I feel like some of X Files' best begin mysterious and had an explanation that was still mysterious, which, you know, the Demigorgon had, but kind of stays within the realm of its scariness through the mysteriousness, as opposed to some of the other problems. Like, it, it just being raw, I guess. And that's not bad. It's, the, really, that's the issue with Stranger Things, is it's got some subtle tonal shifts that happen. Really extreme between seasons, I think. And that's good, I think. But also, uh, a little drift within the seasons. So, you know, I think that's the thing that caused people to maybe um, drop that off. And so, having explained that with Lock and Key, that first episode actually begins with an interesting beginning mystery that um, would seem to be related to the overall mystery, but the biggest issue, I feel, is that there's too much not that going on. It's it's all important, I'm sure, but I think it's a little busier than it really needs to be, because the entire point is that it's trying to introduce this house, this family, and these special keys. And... It does that, but it kind of felt like, oh, and we have to introduce the various kids and some relationships and school stuff and it doesn't feel like it's all completely unrelated but it does feel like it's maybe a little more than it needs to be so I watched the first episode but that one because it kind of felt like it drifted a little off topic with some of its stuff and I guess that's a problem with like a series version of a lot of stuff so X-Files tended to be really good about it because you had a single 40 minute episode you know stretched to an hour with commercials and you had to introduce an idea and stick with that idea so usually when you're introducing side ideas they're thematically related to the main idea in a very obvious way but when you're in a series you can say well we only have to introduce this now and only make it really re relevant to this stuff later. And maybe there's a little bit of that in Stranger Things as well. I can't remember. But I kind of don't feel like it because Stranger Things craziness just kind of builds up over the se series, over the seasons, which is kind of what you want to have happen. But um, each of those are kind of interesting on their own. Whereas this one kind of hasn't done that yet. So that may be a weakness of it, but the mystery definitely works in its favor. I'll have to watch more episodes to know what the series itself is like. And, you know, there's some reason to try to do that because, you know, I've been paying for Netflix but not watching anything for a long time, you know, just because I haven't been in that dire straits financially, which is why, you know, I continue to eat food from local restaurants. I mean, today I got from Chipotle and Mighty Fine. You know, that that's... At this point, I don't think that's as keeping them as afloat. That was more definitely that first couple of weeks, and then I think more people started picking stuff up or ordering to-go stuff. And then um, these past couple of weeks, more places have been opening up, and there's actually been dine-in, and you know, it's it's been nice to see some of the faces that I haven't seen in a while. But uh, I don't know what was I talking about. Oh yeah, you know, Netflix. I just kind of have it there in case I'm going to go visit. If, if I really do need to start um, penny pitching or something like that, it would probably be the first thing to go. But I don't need to, and it allows me to just decide, hey, you know, let me go check this out and see if I want to watch it. Which nowadays, you know, it seems like there's more and more ability to do that. Um, working from home stuff seems to be becoming a more norm thing. 
and I think this should probably be more relevant coming from me than from a lot of voices because a lot of people talk about it like they're really excited and for me I've adjusted to working from home mostly because I'm on a work laptop and I can actually do work while standing in weird places like if I had to stay sitting here at this one desk like I do at work I couldn't do it but this allows me to continue working while I'm standing at the counter over there so I don't need a standing desk I actually stand in the bathtub sometimes with the foot um, bath thing sometimes lying in bed because you know why stand if you're just on a laptop going like this you know might as well go on the side and go like this so but I've had to adjust and there's a part of me right now I'm actually just mostly in a state of I'm waiting for someone to tell me what to do next so if, the, if they just continue having me work from home then that's just what I do if I start driving into the office every day then I'll be doing that like I did before um, if I'm mostly working from home but we're getting together once every other week or twice a week or something like that that's what I'll do I'm pretty much waiting for it to happen but I think for a lot of people they talk about it like they've been excited for it to happen forever and there's a part of me that thinks that it's really easy to be blinded by that and create wishful thinking whereas for me my observation is just that my company is definitely moving forward in that route there seems to be other big companies doing that and once big companies start doing that that does increase the chance that other companies can start considering it. They're not all going to. And there's something to be said about, you know, still a physical presence. I could see a lot of smaller companies still wanting to do it because, you know, you need to, you need more tight integration. Whereas mine, I'm in finance. Uh, it's the financial industry, uh, fintech, I guess, is stuff. And while I don't do a whole lot of money movement stuff, it's still the kind of thing where that company encourages a lot of I was, I was going to say red tape, but I feel like one of the nice things about my company is they haven't really introduced red tape so much as um, made sure a lot of people are really double checking other people. And I know that kind of sounds like red tape, but I think there's a difference there in terms of red tape could almost be more cover your ass sort of stuff. Make sure you have a clearly documented trail of who to blame when something goes wrong. Whereas the thing I'm talking about is more about encouraging people to do the collaborative work, more and more collaborative work, um, in order to make sure, okay, yeah, we're all in agreement, this is what we're going to do, and we've all double-checked, and there's nothing we see wrong here. So, examples of these differences are that, you know, pretty much I could work on anything I want to. In fact, I do have one or two side projects that I am working on that, you know, if I get time, I spend more time working on them. Um, but when I'm not working on those, you know, I'll be working on a main project and like for the thing I'm doing right now, I'm actually documenting, okay, these are my thoughts on what we want to do. That's important because um, not only does it make sure that I have things written down, so like my solutions architect can point out, uh, actually we do have a better way of doing this. My um, other developers can say, actually we have a better way of doing this. You know, they can point out, did you remember to do this? Um, but it allows me to do the research in advance and make sure I have a good solid strategy for moving forward and I know what the pitfalls are. So in this case, um, it's about I need to actually display information on when an account closed from the point of view of another account. Basically if an account upgrades to another one, there are technically two accounts the old one is closed and the new one is opened, all funds are transferred, etc. But the old account still exists and people still want to know information about that account. And um, I need to know when it's closed and I'm looking at how the current system is doing things. It says, oh, I just assumed that it closed when the next one opened and maybe we do things differently. At the moment, I am not... Um, my question, my concern is more, okay, they did it that way because they had to get that together pretty fast, but I want to do it the correct way. What do we use to actually determine that an account is closed? Which I already kind of know. And how can I get that information? Does that exist in the system, etc.? I don't see it in any one place, and I see a couple different variants of it. So I'm going to say, okay, well, let's take this one that's closest and come up with 
a slightly better idea that should be um, reusable by other people, um, adjustable in the future, because I think the biggest problem with a lot of the existing solutions is they don't get updated when new ways to close an account come up that require a different kind of way of mentioning, hey, this account is now closed. <clears throat> and you know, I can document these ideas in advance, which is actually what I did today. I was actually looking into, you know, the details of this and details of, okay, I'm going to update this library and I've not updated any library, internal libraries um, in there. What is the branching process we do for that? Okay, I'm going to reach out to the developer that I see has done the only work this year in that branch and kind of sync up with them to verify if I understand the state of things. Oh, I didn't. I learned something new. Good. And then I document that. So these documents allow another developer to go forward with my work if for some reason I get hit by a bus today and I can't work tomorrow. Or, um, you know, again, if I missed something and my solution architect will be able to tell me. And you can kind of see that's not really red tape. That's we're being encouraged to do this because if I do this before I do the work, and tomorrow's when I would actually start doing the work because that's when we probably pull the stuff into the sprint. This means I have a good plan, what I'm going to do as soon as we start, and I can just get in there and do it, write my tests, boop, 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 you know, get it all wired together. And I had a good plan in advance to do it, and the way we're trying to do things encourages that. Likewise, my change isn't just going to get dumped into production. I've got QAs on my team who are going to say, okay, well, I was able to test it doing this. Or if they weren't able to test it, I was able to verify I wouldn't break things by doing this. And, you know, I will work with them on how to make sure, how to sanity check that I didn't do something stupid. And even then, you know, we've got testing environments where if something did break, somebody could catch it. We've got automated tests. You know, a lot of that stuff is there. It creates work for us to do, but it doesn't create work for us to do bureaucracy. It creates work for us to say, okay, how do we make sure that we're doing what we think we're doing? If you kind of understand, and I forgot why I even started talking about all this. Oh, well. That's one of the neat things about working in this company. And I guess I was mentioning this because it's fintech and it's really about a mindset. But I could see other companies needing people to turn around even faster. Because this especially happens in small companies where you need to get a product out the door so you can start selling something. Right, and this is a problem with professional software development where you always have to balance um, doing the right thing versus doing what you need to do. Because sometimes doing the right thing means that you have to spend a year debugging drivers at the Linux level to figure out why these systems aren't integrating. And if you don't have a year to do that, then you have to figure out what you can do instead. Or, you know, you can just sync. So, I think examples of that in my work is um, because the system has plenty of old components to it, there are some parts in there that um, have little hacks for how to determine that the password on an account is in a certain state. So like, um, passwords are stored in the database, salted and hashed, so that not even developers who have access to the database should be able to theoretically figure out what your password is within the lifetime of the universe. I mean, I don't mean like how much it exists now. I mean like from the beginning to the heat death of the universe. You know, cryptographically absurd that, um, you know, a developer would be able to do that. So, you know, you do that. But there's also, you know, sometimes it says, oh, well, we're going to put the number one in there, which doesn't look like a hash and causes things to throw exceptions when they try to look at the, pro the password. And that's not really a good way to do it because, you know, if at one level it's saying, uh, well, actually, I guess it's actually if it makes it a... Th this is a way in which they can force a password to need to be changed because um, they can't guarantee the veracity of the data. Because I, I think, uh, you know, the hashing has been upgraded over time to become more and more secure to where it is today. But bad early practices meant that, you know, sometimes they had to be cautious. They didn't know if... Uh, bad guys manage to get passwords, so they set them to something that requires people to change their passwords. 
because there is no password data in there. Instead, it throws a not a number exception, and that's probably not a very good way engineering-wise to do it because lots of things could look like that, and it could make the system just think, oh, yeah, they have to um, change their password. But um, it's even worse when that not a number exception gets caught by a completely different process at a higher level closer to the user point because at that point it's so far away from it that the fact that it says not a number is meaningless and so there's a little code rot that can happen there and that's a good example of something that's good to clean up. The problem is that we don't know what all systems it touches. So I had a developer that wanted to f fix the way this was handling that exception and he wanted to do it by refactoring the whole thing which is the right thing to do but we brought it into the sprint knowing that we would not be spending um, a month on it. And that's the problem is a big refactor like that could require us to um, trace things, figure out how to test things. It might not be a month, but it could be an entire month of dev QA time just to make sure that one little fix didn't actually break something else somewhere else and suddenly make it where people can't get to their account ever. You don't want to do that. And that that's a, that's always been a really good example in my mind of trade-offs. You you need to fix tweak it the way it works right now even though you want to fix the real thing. And if you're given the time to fix the real thing, that's great. And the problem here is just that because this exception is expected to cross boundaries into other processes, um, that basically means you have to know all processes that deal with basic login and that could be it could be as many as one, but it could be as many as a dozen. And usually we only test one, one and a half of those. So yeah, usually a, bet, a better idea to play cautious there and say, well, this is all we need to do to tweak it to make it continue working under this old bad way. We know the bad way is bad, but we don't have the time to re-engineer the system because we're working on this other big project technically. So that might be an example of something where if you can make the fix in your spare time, maybe you can. It's probably better to probably have a good thorough research system for something like that just because um, the real problem is the QA bandwidth because QA probably knows how to test the areas of code that you're fixing from your point of view but for all the other untouched systems that they've never tested with well is this one still up and running oh yes okay does this affect them at all I don't know well let's see how we can test that out and if you have to do that for like a handful of systems you know that time adds up real quick so you know there's some thoughts philosophy there I don't know why I've gone this route anyways my plan is to watch Frozen 2 sometime this week um, I think uh, yeah, I have it under here. Date the Live Season 3 is still on my radar. Because I do remember enjoying certain aspects of the first two seasons. And I don't know what Season 3 will even be about. But, I don't know. We'll have to see what I do. That's my babbling for the week, so y'all have a nice one.